We saw the opportunity of automation was to take away the more manual tasks that the guys were doing. And while they're doing these manual tasks, they're not learning. To get that skill into the business, you've got to have time for the guys to learn and develop. And they can't do that if they spend half their time picking parts up and putting them into spindles. Hello and welcome to another MTD podcast. Uh, this week we're on the road. Uh, I'm at GW Martin uh, and that's in Eastleigh down in, is it in Hampshire? Which, it is in Hampshire, yes. It is in Hampshire and with uh, Richard Blake here, a, a colleague and a friend that I've known um, for many years and Joe Reynolds. Um, coming up on today's podcast, we're going to be talking about GW Martin. We're going to be talking about uh, the journey of the last couple of years um, over the course of the pandemic and uh, and some significant growth and investment along the way, which is always good to hear in UK manufacturing. Um, so firstly, we have heard from you, Richard, but I'd like to say welcome to the podcast. Are you keeping well? Very well, thank you. Yeah. Good, good. Good to see you again. And Joe, how are you? You've travelled all the way down here this morning with us as well. Nice drive. Nice part of the world down here. Long way for you. It is a long way. Yeah. yeah. Sun was shining when we left and it was raining when we got here. Maybe that's something about being on the uh, south coast or close to it. <laughs> um, Richard, just uh, throughout today's show, we'll obviously talk about GW Martin, what you do. Um, we'll be talking about the investment that you've made recently and, and some of the, the challenges that you face in uh, in manufacturing. But firstly, give us a little bit of an overview of, of yourself and your role here and, uh, and GW Martin. Uh, well, GW Martin have been here for over 50 years, a very well-established family uh, business. Um, I've been here for about six years. And um, prior to that, as you know, I was in the machine tool business for 30 odd years. Um, and before that, I was a, a tool maker, an apprentice tool maker at Smith's Industries. So um, gone through, the, gone through the, the whole ranks of engineering industry in one form or another. So, um, but it's been very interesting to go from selling machine tools to, to, to buying them. I want to pick up on this because obviously our, you know, our, our relationship back in, I worked for you back in 2002, 2003, I think it was, yeah, yeah. at what was what was DMG then. Yeah. What are the differences that you see nowadays doing what you do here compared to selling machines? I think here is, is much more, I mean... Because you're kind of the opposite end now, aren't you? Yeah, With completely the opposite end. You know, I, I always sort of thought of myself as a, as, a sal as a salesman, I'm not very good at buying things. But um, but we've we've done a good job here of, of I think using some of the the, the, the techniques that that we adopted in the in the machine tool business as the reverse of that it's been quite useful. So we when we buy a machine we do look at the the travels we look at the X Y the Z we look at if we've got three or four machines in mind we do a comparison so we can visually see we put we color them you know red green so we're positive negatives. And, and you know when when we were in the machine tool business, we used to do that a lot. We used to look at the competition, and oh, they're not very good here, and we're very good here, and that kind of thing. So that, that that's kind of transposed over a little bit, and has been and, and to some degree has given you know helped us purchase what we think are the right machines. Well, you'd be one to choose, wouldn't you, when you think of the experience you've got in the industry? Exactly. Yeah, and I've been lucky, really. I mean, the the, the management here at, G, at GW Martin have uh, have recognised that experience, and so I've been. Yeah, you know, quite instrumental in helping this investment. Is it as much fun though? God, we used to have some fun back in the day, didn't we? Two decades ago, <laughs> I'd have been in my what mid twenties then, and you would have been in your early forties. Yeah, 40s, yeah no, it's not as much fun. I must admit, <laughs> the machine tool business is a lot of fun. Was a lot of fun, and uh, we did have a good time then. We did. And um, Joe, you've seen out on the shop floor today. We've 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 done some great videos here for uh, Mazak. Um, it's great to see this level of investment, isn't it, and the automation that they've got here. It is. Firstly, it's nice to get on the podcast amongst you two reminiscing. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, no, it's, I've, I've seen a lot of GW Martin on the MTD channels, but it's actually my first visit here and I'm, I'm blown away by the level of investment, certainly in the last, what, two to three years, um, a couple of million pound plus. But yeah, in, in terms of the Mazak machines, yeah, the, the, you know, Mazak, you've gone some of the more, I suppose, the upper echelon of their, their portfolio, haven't you? Some of their, some of their more premium machines, shall I call it, but gantry loaded, Fed machines, the HQR multitasking machines, very, very nice machines. And before we carry on, Richard, can I just ask you to shut your window at the back there? Because we can you might be able to hear a bit of feedback on the podcast and that might but might be a bit clearer. So um talk us through the challenges, some of the challenges you face while you're here now then, Richard, and some of the reasons that you've gone down the line of such a a lot of investment in the last two years. Well, I think we've we've looked one of the key drivers for us was was productivity how how we we asked the question how can we improve our productivity 
and and one area we looked at was was automating the the, the, the manual processes that we were carrying out. So we did uh, without without automation. Obviously, you, you're relying on people to do a lot of work, a lot of manual intervention. And what we try to look at is is how how can we try and reduce that manual intervention and get more automation to 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 intervene there and and that's that was the start really for us and um, we a bit, we've been here a, such a long time people that we've got uh, out on the shop floor have been with the company a long time some have been apprentices for many years and have grown up with the company and so they've they've developed uh, practices that, that have been very much around their experience here um, and so. From my point of view, coming from from the outside world in, certainly from the machine tool business in, you know, it was an opportunity. So well, actually, you know, there are different ways of doing things, and uh, and and exposed everybody to that. The opportunities are, are that are out there. So, so what are you making? What does the company do? We're we're a precision engineering company, manufacturing precision components. We we um, we've got an assemb- We've added an assembly capability, so we we can make. Parts and we can make assembled components, both both mechanical and electrical, or electro electro mechanical. Um, and is there any areas of industry that you specifically target? No, we t- we know we don't. We're very open. I mean, we're happy to take on any project uh, for any any industry. We, we've we've made a, 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 a we've made it our business to have a broad uh, order book, as it were, across many spectrums. So. It doesn't pay to hook into any one industry like oil and gas or so forth because those you tend to go up and down with those markets. Uh, so getting a broad spectrum is, is you know gives you much more stability. And just to touch on your automation again, I know you're data driven here, aren't you? you? Talk a lot about OEE and things. So how would a like for like job? Presumably there was a job that you were doing previously, you know, to when you in first invested in automation. How does that look like in terms of OEE and you know basically money through the machine? I think we've um, the the yeah, the efficiency's gone up quite a bit, certainly in the automated area. Um, I would say. 35 40 percent more efficient on on the automated side this this was because we were manually loading you know this is a lot of this is billet work so if we were ma- if we were manually loading billets and taking billets out all day and you've got a robot doing the same thing you're going to gain an, an efficiency just off of that but then on top of that the machines are much quicker they're newer machines yeah they, we have better opportunity to optimize the programs the tooling's much better now Better, uh, with newer machines, you can use better tooling. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so when you add the whole package up you know, and then you add the automation into that, you, d- you get a massive gain in efficiency. So on your on your new purchases, whenever they may occur, it, is, is it like to have automation integrated into the machine? I, I think we would be um, unlikely to, to, to walk away from automation going forward. I think it's the future. Even, 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 I think the next challenge is to get the, the automation to lower volume work. You know, we, we're automating reasonable, medium to high volume, but I think uh, the lower volume area as well is where we could also look at. And just to set the scene as well, because we, we haven't done this yet, but the machines that you're, we're talking about here, I mean, you've invested recently in star sliding head lathe technology, haven't you? Mm. You've got two CMZ gantry load uh, fixed head machines, as well as now four multiplex machines from Mazak, uh, which are two of which are gantry loaded, or, or all four of those gantry loaded? No, actually. two two so, brand new gantry loaded, and then two that we had for, we've had for 14 years. And then you've got the Hyper Quadrex, which you've just bought in. Yeah. And then you've also got a suite of uh, Index and Miano machines. So quite a lot of spindles in here to keep occupied. Yes, yes, a lot of capacity. And uh, yeah, we're constantly on the lookout for, for new customers. We, 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 we tend to, you know, the, the way we approach it is we look at um, uh, working as a partner with our clients. So we, we, we don't, we're not interested in doing a, a short batch of 20 parts and then say goodbye see you again we're looking at we look at building a long-term relationship so with the, all the clients we've got here we've had for a number of years uh, we've built great relationships up with them we work very closely with them we help them sometimes on on engineering issues and and uh, and it's, we see it as a true partnership because the challenges are the key things we try and uh, find out and, and and get out of these these conversations because we go into a lot of machine shops and their their forward order books are no more than four to six weeks and you listen and you think 
Really? Is, is that the only security you've got in this business, four to six weeks? Or mm. Not like that here, is it? You were telling no. me earlier you've got some quite solid and secure yes. customers. Yeah, we've got... It must we, be com- got, quite comforting. It's very... It, is, it gives you a lot of confidence to, and then it helps you plan ahead. I think that's the biggest... The biggest um, uh, asset to having a long-term order book is being able to plan ahead. Whereas I think if you're a little bit hand-to-mouth, it's very difficult to do that. So... But we've balanced the order book. I think we've got we've got a long term order book and we've got a short term you know order book. So we've got clients that may or may not buy components from one day to the next, and we've got clients that have put forward orders in that we know exactly what we're going to produce for them six to eight months from now. And this automation side, does it? Uh Big question in the industry, and I fact I heard a, I was listening when I was walking the other night to a, pro, a, a program on LBC, and somebody rang in and actually said. You know, with the um, automation becoming so big now, a lot more jobs are going to go. So, you know, there's going to be more unemployed. You've invested in automation. Is there less people working here now, or is no. it still the same? No, it's still the same. Um, we've we've what we what we saw the opportunity of automation to do was to take away the more manual tasks that the, 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 the guys were doing. And, and while, while the guys are, are doing these manual tasks, they're not learning. They're not, they're, not, they're not doing more complex components, more setups, more programming. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we, we, were, we were sort of clagging up their time with manual tasks and not, not using their time for more you know, higher precision, short runs, you know, setting, operating programming you can't do that if you're sitting there loading and unloading machine all day so we we just saw the automation side of it as as, in that respect as as freeing up time for our guys to be better trained better skilled higher levels of skill because there's no question you know the uk is going to be a high skilled engineered market it's not going to be a high volume low skilled market it's going to be a high skilled market so to get that skill into the business, you've got to have time for the guys to learn, go out on training courses and develop. And they can't do that if they spend half their time picking mm. parts up and putting them into spinders. I have to say it's the perfect answer, isn't it? Mm. Yeah. No, but that's what's just letting you keep going, Richard. It's absolutely. <coughs> yeah, no, that, that, that's that literally the perfect answer. You know, it's mundane, isn't it? You guys can't, presumably, don't like stand there all day or all night loading billets. They can't like it, surely. But they get used no. to it. They get used to it, and and it's not until they change. Some people don't like change, do they? Full no. stop. You know, um, and and but it's not until you implement that change that they can see they've spent many years doing something that they shouldn't have done. No, absolutely. I mean, this business, as I said, has been here fifty years. Some people here have been here 35, 40 years, and were apprentices here. So to come in here after a couple of years and say, oh, we're going to change everything, they think we're, you know, why? You know, what on earth would you want to do that for? Quite quite um, understandably. Um, but once once we were able to get the first piece of automation in and just demonstrate what it really meant, how, how it would help them, and how how they really didn't want to do, you know, that, a, a task like that, then then the, the, all the lights started coming on and that change culture that we, we knew we needed to put in place was became a bit easier. Mm. Well, um, so, so just a quick one for me we had a great tour today great um, visit to your facility I noticed there's not many min- milling machines not many BMCs is, is that is that because you don't get much milling or you think you can be more efficient doing milling on a on a turning machine yeah we, we do a lot of milling on the turning machine so they are mill, all of our machines have got driven tools and mill, mill turned capability and I remember years ago it was at DMG they, I don't even might remember it they bought out what's called a bar machine we could machine six six faces. It was a remember it was a bar machine. It was a brand new design, but but, but basically the whole thing came off finished, and it was it was one of the first sort of exposures. Did I it had. have like a set of legs on it or something? Yeah, it was, it was a, a weird looking it. thing. Yeah, yeah. but it, it was the first exposure I got to a, a bar fed machine that took a mill to sort of a square looking part that looked like a milled part really. And it came off in one hit. Didn't have to touch it. I'm, I'm just looking at one here. That's why I ask. You yeah, know, that's, that's, I know, exactly I know, it. I know this is a podcast, and you can't see it, unfortunately. Maybe we'll have it as the thumbnail. But mm. you know, it's that's a that's a that's a turn. Uh, sorry, a milled part, Com- really. That's a milled part, but it's all done on a on a turn mill turn machine. And uh, and I remember we did we did a, a, a we sold a machine to a company up in the north that 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 wanted we're making valve blocks. So you take you know six face valve block drilled and tapped at ports 
little ports in each face. You think, pop that, you know, you'd immediately say that's a million job. No, yeah, it was doing it on the bar machine, off in one. Yeah, yeah. Well, this is where you, you, you know, you, you've got the advantage, really. I mean, it's a lot of, a lot of machine, uh, machining environments we walk around. And you look at the way someone's doing something and you go, actually, you could do that better. Mm. You, you, you genuinely could. But what we haven't seen is that here today. So you've obviously applied a lot of the knowledge you've got through through the years to be able to make things in a, in a, a more productive way. So often we go in places and you look at the way they're doing things. And you just think you should do that on a, a machine with driven tools with a Y axis. You could get it off in one hit, sub spindle. And people always say, yeah, but those machines are going to cost me a fortune. I said to you earlier, and I'd like to repeat it on this podcast, the fact that you invest in a lot of machines here and you put a lot of money into the business, does that mean that it, your parts cost more or is your customer going to get a better deal as a result of your technology and ambition to drive parts through quicker? As I said, I think we are, as com- we are more competitive now than we've ever been. And that's just, just that's good news because the market is very competitive. So, you know, most most of the components that we bring into the company are are probably being done already by someone else. And so if that's the case, how, how are we going to get them? You know, we're not going to just walk in and say, well, you know, get, can we make those parts for you or charge you twice the price? You're going to have to be competitive if you stand any chance. And so you've got to be competitive. And, of course, to, to invest millions of pounds in new equipment, we've got to be profitable. And we can't invest that money if we're not making a profit. So, no, I think the, the automation has, has helped us become much more competitive whilst maintaining a, a profitable uh, profile for the business. Mm. Going forward, what's going to happen in the next two years? I mean, we've had quite a challenge, haven't we, in the last year or so? Yeah. You've come through it okay, obviously. Um, invested your way out of it in, in some senses. Where yep. do you see the future, Richard? I think more, more of the same. I think, I think uh, big attention to looking after the clients, making sure the customers are happy forming partnerships, making sure you've got a true partnership with the customer. So we, 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 we win together. And um, I think that's been a big part of the customer. Our customers are, have been on board now for a while and, mm-hmm. and, they're, and, and there's a, we've got a good, solid, long-term partnership with them. So I think that, that gives stability to the business. Um, but the technology needs to continue. We need to keep applying it in a way that helps improve as much as we can, the productivity of the business. Do you think there'll be an argument? And I was in a machine shop the other week where they had, they were gonna, they were gonna basically buy another unit to put more spindles in, and then the the MD stepped back and he looked and he goes, "Do you know what? Hang on a minute. I don't know whether I need to do this. Maybe I can replace a lot of the spindles I've got in here with more efficient machinery, with maybe." you know, dual spindle machines or maybe machines that are far more capable. He went through this exercise. It took him 18 months to try and work out what was the best route to go down. And as a, as a consequence, what happened, he didn't buy that new unit. And now he's got the same capacity, in fact, a bit more capacity, and a third of his machine shop is empty. Because what he's done is he's moved things around and he's assessed how he can get more from a machine, basically. Yeah. Is that something you think you'll do here? Oh, we're all doing. Absolutely. I think we, we've got the um, overall equipment effectiveness system working very well now. So we've got, so the first thing you have to do is get a, a, a way of measuring what you're doing, a good way of measuring what you're doing. So OEE is the industry standard for measurement of that. Once you've got, once you've got that measurement properly working, you can see where you are. And if you're, if you're turning, you know, the numbers are quite easy to work out. You know, if you're turning over, Six million pounds a year, and your 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 OEE of seventy percent. It means there's there's thirty percent of six million pounds there not being realised. You know, it's not a small number, right? Mm, yeah, it's twenty two million. Yeah, that's two million, right? So so you know that that's there to go get. You don't have to buy in any more equipment to get that. That's that's there to get out of what you've got, and and that's that's what makes this business so interesting because you can then well where's that going? You know, and so what you really then the next step is to get right in there and start finding out. You know, are we are we are we optimised the program? Are we using the right tooling? Are we scrapping any parts? If we are, how many? Why? Um, you know, is the machine not running all the time? If it isn't, why? And then you can look at solutions to that. You know, and those rotor racks that we bought, for instance, great solution. You know, why isn't the machine <laughs> running all the time? Well, we have to stop to pick the part and do this. Stick a rotor rack in it. Now, why is it running all the time? Well, it is. Fine. Yeah. Job done. Rotor rack, eight thousand quid. Machine runs all day. 
I have to say, it's a bit different to selling the machine tool, Richard, all, yeah. the, all this. <laughs> yes, it is. <clears throat> yeah, it is a bit different. It's the other end. It's completely the other end, but it's, it's just as interesting, just mm -hmm. as fascinating. And for, for those of you listening that don't know, uh, Paul used to work with Richard. Yeah. Work with? Yeah. For? For? With? What, what was he like? What was Mr. Jones like as an he employee? He was an outstanding sales guy. <laughs> oh, come on. <laughs> you've, got to give, you've got to give us more than that. Yeah, <laughs> I, I learned a lot from Richard, in fairness, about how to close a deal. Um, I learned that any more than six visits, I think it was, there yeah. was a statistic Forget once it. you'd got a six or you went, when, when, when you were making that seventh visit, you were getting one visit further away from the order. And it was something <laughs> like that, wasn't it? That's so you right, always yeah. used to know you used to get in, yeah. you know, get to the get to the bones of what someone wanted, get it quoted and get it sold. Yeah, and, uh, yeah we, no, it's true. The longer the deal's on the table, the less chance you've got to get in it. Yeah, and we needed to do deals. Um, yeah. Uh, thanks for bringing that one up, Joe, but I'm glad, I'm glad of uh, Richard's response. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, what, what about the uh, the medical industry and the aerospace industry? Aerospace obviously taking a nosedive. Were you involved yeah. in that? And no. Not at all, no. No, we did look at it because we're not uh, 9,100 here. We're, we're um, ISO 9,001 and 14,001, but we're not 9,100, which you need for uh, to go direct to the aerospace market. Um, we, we did a bit of a gap analysis on the quality systems that we run to see where we were and how much it would cost to get up to that speed. And to be honest, it wasn't a lot. I don't think there's a huge gap, but it was enough to sort of say, to, and the cost was enough to say, you know, do we, can we, can we go out and get, put that investment in and get the business to cover it? And so we just decided not to. And we went, you know, broader really to, into other markets that didn't require it. And um, and and we've we've been fine without it. And medical, medical. We used to do quite a bit of medical work here many years ago, and uh, it, I think we we much more com it's a much more complex market in terms of um, the uh, the manufacturing of the components. And I think when I first got here, we probably weren't well equipped to go into that market, but we are now. We've invested in a new Esprit offline system. Which we've now got post processors linked into most of our machines. So, what does our, that do for you? That software. Well, it, it, may, it massively improves our programming capability. And if you go into the medical market, you're going to come up against some fairly complex parts. And and I think to to really do that efficiently and and compete, you're going to have a package behind it which which includes programming. You know, good quality programming. Uh, and I think that's. Something we never had here, we, we, but we've now put in place, and and slowly we're starting to get good at that. So over the next few years, I'd like to get into the middle market. I really would. And motorsport, because it's an area we were involved in yeah. at DMG back in the back in the day. Yeah. And um, you must have a lot of contacts in that area. Yeah. It must be something. Is it something that you want to be be doing here at GW Martin Yeah, I motorsport think so. Work? I think we would love to. So again, we got we're, we're nearly there. We Is the geographics a problem? Because that 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 sort of M40 corridor was always yeah. there. Yeah, it's not too bad, is it? I, mean, you know, I suppose you're not far. not far away from Oxford. I mean, the hub of hub of um, motorsport up in there in Enstone at Renault and where we used to sell <coughs> all the DMG machines in those mm. old days. So, yeah. No, I think we're, we're, we're well within the right... I mean, and, and as, you, as you mentioned, probably got some good contacts. But I think, again, we've got to wait until we, 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 need, a, we need a five axis milling machine. We don't have that. We, have, we get to four axis and then we, we stop. So the next step for us is to look at bringing a five axis machine and I think then we can look at that market a little bit more seriously. Good stuff. Okay, gentlemen. Well, thank you very much for joining us on this podcast today. It always goes quickly. It's 25 minutes, would you believe? Um, Richard, it's been uh, great to see you again. And it's always good to come here and see, um, every, as I said at the start, this, every time I come here, there seems to be new technologies, um, you know, new machines invested in. And uh, uh, good luck on the golf course going forward. I'm sure you're still doing that as well, are you? Absolutely, yes. <laughs> <laughs> One of those big cigars at the end of it, too. <laughs> exactly, yes. <laughs> thank you very much for joining us, guys. Thank you very much, Joe. Thanks, Richard. Thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the MTD podcast. If you found value in this episode, please subscribe and leave a rating and review. Find more episodes on mtdcnc.com.